welcome. Thank you all so much for uh, coming to this uh, talk that uh, Davidja and I are holding. It's our first live conversation. Uh, many of you have probably seen our pre-recorded talks on YouTube, and we uh, we both felt it would be nice to have the opportunity for us to be here together in real time and to uh, explore some of the the subjects that we've already explored, and then open it up for, for questions and answers at the end. So I'm here with uh, my friend, uh, David Davidja Buckland. David is an author. He has a book called Our Natural Potential, where he explores the stages of enlightenment. He also has a blog called davidja.ca, where he explores the stages of enlightenment, but also explores different themes that uh, relate to the unfoldment of awakening and how that shows up in daily life. He is uh, someone that I would consider to be a, a great seer of our age. Um, he has a capacity for cognition and shares that gift freely through um, exploring the details of the unfoldment of creation from a Vedic perspective. I'm very grateful for his friendship and uh, for the opportunity to be here with him today. So thank you so much, David, for oh. taking the time. You're very welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And I'm Andrew Houston. I'm a spiritual teacher. I teach the path of non-dual devotion, which is a path which... Um, emphasizes the devotion to truth, the love of love. I uh, speak to four primary pillars of spiritual expression and uh, yeah, have the honor and the privilege of witnessing uh, the unfoldment of divine reality. So today, David and I are going to be speaking about this unfoldment. Uh, the stages of enlightenment, what I refer to as contextual modalities. And we're going to look at uh, how healing and transmutation relate uh, to this process. As we move into this, I just invite everyone to notice the silence that's already here. And during the speaking, during the conversing, the exploration, just allow what is underneath the words to make itself known. We can walk into this from the heart, from an openness, a willingness. And just rest in this presence as uh, David and I explore together. So David, uh, would you like to start? We're gonna just go over the basic uh, initial shift, the awakening, and then explore how that unfolds through the stages and modalities. Sure. Um, it's good to first add a little context. There's kind of a a duality in the process, we could say, um, sometimes described as Shiva and Shakti or the masculine and feminine aspects. But essentially, um, or in Vedic terms, it's Atman and Sattva. Um, essentially, it, it's uh, the unfolding of consciousness to itself and the refinement of perception and awakening heart so that the all the layers between the surface experience and that inner reality, our inner nature, our true nature, um, we come into awareness. So it's not just about consciousness, it's about all of it uh, coming together and waking up to itself. So the the first shift in the in the Vedic model that I, I base my model on, um, is known as cosmic consciousness or self-realization. 
And that's essentially where uh, that inner presence or uh, witness observer wakes up to itself through this body mind. So um, sometimes the witness value can come online prior to awakening, and sometimes it comes online with the shift. Um, but essentially we fall back into a kind of observer mode and there's a, a fundamental duality. Sometimes self-realization is framed in terms of non-duality because there's an inner sense of non-duality uh, and the outer world may be uh, experienced as illusory or uh, a detached, uh, less meaningful uh, part of reality. And, uh, and so uh, it's kind of dismissed, but it's actually a, a, the, the fundamental nature of that experience is of a duality of self within and outer world experience content. Um, and then the, the next shift that tends to happen in this process is um, that we realize that there's kind of a screen behind the, the world appearance um, that is also consciousness and that that is the same consciousness as within. So there's kind of a merging of the subject object dynamic. Um, and consciousness itself has a threefold nature. There's the observer value, the observed, the, the appearance, the objects of the world. And then there's the process of experience between it, between them, the, the, that's the, where the quality of intelligence is dominant. And it's where the laws of nature are functioning, essentially creating the experiences that we're having um, in this process. That's actually one of the qualities of, of self-realization is we realize we thought we were the doer and, and tried to control our life experience and so on, resisting what we don't want and grasping what we want. But with the shift, that falls away. And um, we realize that we're not the doer. We're, we're the observer of the things that are happening. And um, so there's a refinement process that can happen in there if there is sufficient uh, sattva or healing uh, refinement going on. And um, that um, unfolds a process and in an ideal scenario between that, that initial shift and the unity shift where the two come together is a process known as refined cosmic consciousness or God consciousness or celestial consciousness it has various names, but where the essentially that inner, uh, those inner values of um, refinement and uh, um, the subtle nature of becoming become apparent. So one of the things that can happen is when we wake up, we realize we're not the doer. So what, what is the doer? Who, who, what's doing? Uh, how is this the world around us? How are these experiences happening? And that can help lead us into that refinement and um, perception of the mechanics of the world around us. Um, so that's the God consciousness stage. And then there's the unity stage and then a refined value. So these are kind of, um, masculine and feminine processes, essentially, that there's the, the Shiva value, the, the, the observer wakes up to itself, then it wakes up to the quality in the world. And then the, there's the feminine part, part of the process, the Shakti value, where we're uh, experiencing the, the values of the world, the awakening heart. Um, now, this isn't uh, the Anahata heart chakra kind of a thing that can happen during the rise. This is kind of like a higher heart value where we're waking up to much deeper values uh, of uh, universal love and, and, uh, and capacity. Um, and then um, there's a refined value of unity where, where those qualities, if they've been developing prior, are, are now unfolding in a new context of unity. And there's essentially unity uh, unfolds in stages itself, uh, sub-stages you could say, um, because there's a, uh, that process of integrating everything in that one wholeness takes time. I mean, there's that initial recognition that the self of the world and the self within are the same and they collapse together into one wholeness. But then there's a whole lot of other layers to the experience and our memories and you know, distant parts of the, of the universe beyond our experience and so forth and behind our perception that all uh, gradually uh, come together into one wholeness. So there's kind of like this process of experience and become uh, taking place, or recognizing we are already. Um, at a certain point in this process, and this is a real kind of 
Cole's notes, brief uh, overview. At a certain point in that process, um, we come to be aware of the totality of awareness in some value. There's the um, uh, essentially consciousness is aware of itself globally and at every point within itself. And once that's known sufficiently, um, there's a number of ways that, it, that the recognition can happen. But um, um, for example, we've been consciousness has been looking in on itself this whole time, awareness aware of itself. And once it's fully aware of itself, there's kind of this thing where we can turn and, and look beyond consciousness, which is a bit of a, at the time can be quite unexpected because there's that um, um, you know, sense of you know, consciousness being infinite and eternal and, and who I am and you know, the ultimate reality and the source of all. And then we see beyond it, uh, essentially uh, what they call in, in um, the Sanskrit uh, context, uh, Brahman. It's the great. Um, and it's referred to in some of the texts as the supreme awakening because we're, we, we essentially wake up from our prior enlightenment. <laughs> and uh, and that, uh, it's quite a shift in perspective. And then there's kind of a refined version of that that can unfold also. Um, and, um, and then there's a kind of a coming together of the two sides of the masculine and feminine process into one totality. Um, known as parabrahman, which means beyond Brahman, which kind of seems beyond the beyond, you know, the source of the source has, has a number of ways of being framed, um, but it's essentially pure divinity. Just as we came to pure consciousness in the process of unfolding the awakening process in samadhi or um, deep meditation, or and then with awakening to that, we can experience these qualities of pure consciousness without content then we can get a value of, of pure divinity uh, in there. So that's kind of a a quick overview. There's a lot of detail in there. Yeah. I've got a Thank whole you. book on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, you do have a, a wonderful um, point of reference that uh, everyone can check out. So we're very grateful for that. I'll uh, just kind of do a similar brief overview just to give a little bit of a different perspective and um, some different languaging. So I also uh, recognize and speak often about the, uh, the masculine feminine distinction. This is what I refer to as the, the primary distinction between uh, pure awareness, the silent, changeless, pure perceiving of this field and conscious presence, the vibrant, full uh, conscious aliveness of the self. So I have uh, had the opportunity to witness a different uh, type of initial shift, which you and I have also explored in our previous conversations, where the feminine aspect is actually um, waking up to itself first. And so in this case, or in these cases, um, what's taking place is the, the vibrant, full conscious aliveness um, of this field is becoming is recognizing itself and becoming thicker and thicker in what appears to be sort of a progressive substantiation, uh, which includes the recognition of itself and the appearances of form and uh, different uh, flows or different movements, different activity, and then uh, flowering into the seeing of itself as itself. And in this case or in these cases, or multiple cases um, that are unfolding like this. Um, and that's also the way that it uh, unfolded here. But what takes place is then the, uh, there's a clicking into the masculine aspect uh, after the feminine aspect has already realized itself or recognized itself. And so this uh, shows up as a, a clicking into the pure silent seeing of the vibrant full conscious aliveness and there can be lots of variation in the midst of this as you just said uh, one of the things that we've also spoken about is how 
there can be uh, a stage or a phase or a period where there is more of an emphasis on the recognition of what's not here. And that uh, is oftentimes referred to as no self hmm, with a lowercase s. And so in this uh, period, there is a, a sense of being emptied out. You know, everything that seemed to be the case before is seen through. And this really pertains to the, uh, the shifting on the mental level of identification and conceptualization and superimposition. Uh, at least yeah, self-concept, yeah, or self-concepts, self -concept. yeah, exactly. All that stuff, yeah, exactly. Now, this oftentimes gets mistake gets mistaken as being um, the ultimate sort of uh, shift, mm -hmm. and so there are certain you know non-dual understandings that um, push this or put this forward as the as what it's all about, and and in that context, oftentimes um, limit the capacity to hear about stages or or modalities or or continued development. So it's important to take note of that and um, also to, to recognize that that generally doesn't involve or include this field of divine light actually seeing itself as itself. There yes. is more just a sense of there not being a self uh, and you know the world can appear relatively um, the same apart from the fact that um, all of the meaning and value and significance that correlated with this limited sense of self also is rendered insubstantial. And there's yeah. different ways in which that can show up as well. Yeah. So I described this, um, this feminine style uh, shift. And then there's also the masculine shift where that silent, changeless, pure awareness is uh, waking up to itself and it is seeing itself as that underlying seeing, that pure seeing of all of the uh, three-dimensional presentations uh, and formations and the, the play of activity. Now, we've also spoken about how, um, according to the degree of uh, egoic density or according to the degree of the, uh, how would we say, the clarity of the conscious experiencing, there's going to be differentiation in the way in which the, the world is held. And, and that's not something that's fixed either that can shift. You've described it, described it um, through the context of the gunas. Yes. And uh, those different qualitative filters uh, that are still present even in um, an authentic shift or an authentic awakening because they make up the basic um, structuring of, of conscious experiencing. Yeah, it's useful to note here that, that the underlying process is the same mm -hmm. uh, for everybody, uh, but there is a huge mm -hmm. variation in the uh, subjective experience of that. Yes. Um, just, and, and there's a number of, you know, you mentioned the gunas and, and uh, the primary, that primary masculine feminine duality we've talked about. Yeah. Um, but there's quite a few different kinds of things that can influence the you know, our background and orientation, you know, the type of physiology we have and um, all kinds of things. Yes, yes. Very uh, helpful points there, David. Yeah. And, and, it's, uh, and that's where it's important to understand the broader process so that we don't get in the way of it, essentially, because yeah. we can have concepts that, that, you know, oh, there's only this one awakening and anything else is uh, an illusion. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had people come to me and objecting to, to uh, the idea that there's more and then coming back later when they realized that they thought they were losing their awakening um, because it was changing and becoming something else. And, and then they realized that actually there was more and it yes. was moving further. Yeah, really beautiful, really beautiful points. I call that uh, qualitative consistency. So irrespective of the uh, tradition, irrespective of the, the unique way in which the, the process unfolds, there is an underlying general qualitative consistency uh, that is present in the process and in the different shifts. And that's what you and I tend to speak about is that qualitative consistency, not to the exclusion of the uniqueness, um, but to the recognition that it's one uh, essential intelligence that is unfolding as this. And this is uh, verifiable irrespective of the tradition. Um, it, it has unfolded in many different ways in many different cultural contexts and it has been spoken about um, 
in different settings. And that doesn't mean that there aren't unique cognitions and unique flavors and unique ways in which conscious experiencing or conscious awareness holds itself and sees itself um, mechanically, structurally, so on and so forth. Mm. But that that general underlying qualitative consistency is recognizable irrespective of the unique flavor uh, or the unique contextualization of the of the process. Yeah, and that uniqueness is actually an essential part of the process. Uh, when you see the consciousness in its global nature, it has it all is already globally self-aware. But there's all these point values, one of which is uh, this body mind expression, and um, the point of having all these different apparent separate people is so that they can have different perspectives of the one whole. Mm. And it's all of us together that, that create the totality of, of self-knowing. Beautiful. And so so there's an, it's an built into the system for us to have a unique process mm. and to have a unique perspective. But in the context, if we understand the underlying, underlying uh, process, then uh, we can easily support our unique unfolding. Yes, very, very... Uh beautiful points. Again, I, I also find that sometimes there's a, there can be an overemphasis on the uniqueness um, that potentially limits the sort of uh, the alignment with the underlying qualitative consistency. And I think you and I have yeah. both seen cases like this where um, the spiritual ego gets involved in the, in the uniqueness and there can be different um, blind spots or self-limiting conclusions or uh, how would we say, um, sort of movements away from the, the general underlying uh, intelligence through an overemphasis on the particularity of the way in which yeah. something is unfolding. Now, sometimes it's not about ego. It's about the person only referring to their own experience. Ah. And my experience is this. And so this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. But it's a little tricky when you generalize and say, my experience is everyone's experience, because that's when you can, you know, you can you can run into issues like, like um, uh, we narrow it too far or don't understand the underlying process. Yes. For example, sometimes when, well, when people wake up, there's usually, it comes with um, some purification and some uh, opening. And sometimes people have a flashier uh, kind of awakening. Sometimes it's very quiet and ordinary, and, but sometimes there's a, bit, there's a bit of flash that comes with it. And then they can confuse the flash with the awakening. But the awakening is that shift in consciousness within, and it would, and the, the the flash and the purification are side effects. That's not the actual awakening, and uh, confusing the two is or confusing them is is uh, you can get misled by that. Yes, yeah, very beautiful points. Again, I also find that it's uh, helpful just to clarify the languaging. When I use the term ego, I I'm typically referring to a a centralization of subjectivity, uh -huh. and so what you're describing is basically just that subjectivity that is this one self and the tendency for subjectivity to um, project, you know, its own conclusion or its own recognition of itself as being what's going on out there. Yeah. So when we have this understanding that um, there is a broader underlying general consistency, then that enables us to flexibly accommodate the uniqueness and the details uh, without losing the the underlying intelligence. And of course, there's yeah. various extremes there. You could go too far into the details, which is what I was attempting to describe um, there, or you could go too far into the, into the generality. So uh, this kind of is similar to the masculine feminine on some level, we might say, but there yeah. is a, there's a, there's a balance. There's a fine balance that uh, makes itself known or reveals itself. And uh, in that we're able to uh, coherently be with um, both the uniqueness and the underlying consistency in a way which is in alignment with the whole. So that uh, there's a, just a couple other points I wanted to make around the, the basic unfoldment of the modalities because there's another distinction um, that I've noticed in reference to the, uh, the beyond consciousness shift that as you call it or what I refer to as um, Supreme nothingness. There's a there's a, a modality that I qualify called source awareness, where there's a recognition of that qualityless, attributeless, 
source value um, actually prior to the unification of the masculine and feminine values of divine light. So that's pure, silent, changeless awareness and full, vibrant, conscious presence. And in that source awareness, there can be what shows up as almost a, um, a triple layering. So there's a recognition of both the feminine and masculine aspect, but they haven't unified quite yet. And there's also uh, what you might refer to as a taste of Brahman or a, a recognition of that qualityless totality, but it hasn't recognized itself as itself. And so therefore yeah. it's not the great awakening, um, but it's a little bit of a precursor or a foresight. And there's variation there as well. I have seen it, I've observed cases um, where it's almost as if through looking back at that quality, that qualityless totality, there is the definition or the sort of, how would we say the, the proclaiming of um, I to be that, the reality to be that, but that shift hasn't taken place to where you're looking from that into the field of conscious awareness. So it still seems that there's a looking back instead of that being there being a shift in the identity from within the field of conscious awareness to beyond it. Yeah. And that's yeah. the, the supreme nothingness shift or what I uh, often call the void or supreme nothingness. Yeah, a similar thing can happen with initial awakening too, where, where we were very aware of the self and even the sense of that is who I am, but the identification can still be with the, the personal self. Yes. And so yes. There, it hasn't let go yet and to become the cosmic self. And there's a value, yes. particularly if there's a bunch of uh, witnessing going on um, mm -hmm. prior to uh, actual awakening. Um, I've seen some people who consider themselves awake simply because they're witnessing and yet don't recognize that there's still that identification in there, which kind of constrains it. It's like a, a flavor of awakening, but it's not the full, uh, the full thing yet. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because in, this, uh, in these feminine shifts that I've been observing and um, was describing earlier, because of the progressive building of it, and it, it being more of a climactic sort of flowering or unfolding, there's oftentimes intense field recognition, vibrant fullness, while there still is identification with the body mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that reaches a threshold point where there is a definite shift, but uh, unlike a, a masculine shift, it doesn't have that clean click kind of yeah. um, promptness, promptness to it. Uh, so for those that are experiencing more of that vibrant aliveness becoming conscious of itself seeing itself and that building the thickening of that uh, it is still it's unfolding it's flowering but it just tends to be a little bit more on the progressive side a little bit more on the climactic sort of unfoldment side yeah and and the current time too where we've got a lot of people that are waking up um and it, it's kind of it's it's the universal consciousness that's waking up to itself so it's yeah. this progressive it lifts all boats so to speak and so everybody is is drawn up with that so that's creating a lot of side effects and purification in the collective but um um it's also allowing that kind of thing to take place mm. yeah i think a few decades ago you wouldn't have seen that simply because the the collective wouldn't have supported well there might have been some exceptions but it wouldn't would have been nowhere near as easy for that kind of refinement to unfold uh, within the context of, of the whole because we're all you know we're in this environment uh, in this collective together and yeah. uh, so it's uh yeah so it's a beautiful thing it is very um, beautiful yeah and just to kind of emphasize that point the in in this context there is a, a heavy emphasis on healing or what i call transmutation which is essentially yeah. the, the conversion of uh, latent unresolved energy um, back into that vibrant aliveness, that blissful um, conscious existence. And there's also more of a devotional um, approach. So, you know, those uh, tend to be supportive within yeah. that, within that uh, style of unfoldment as well. Yeah, um, it might be useful at this point to just touch on the gunas really briefly. Sure. Uh, and you can talk about that process a little bit. There's a few ways of looking at it, but uh, essentially, there's everything has 
a combination of three fundamental fundamental qualities, and there um, one tends to be dominant though in any given whatever physiology object uh, whatever uh, mm -hmm. context. Um, and the the first is known as Thomas, which essentially is very similar to the idea of inertia. It's kind of a, a the tendency to to be fixed and not to want to change and be rigid. And it, it uh, also has a tendency to, to give a quality of shadow, and especially in this kind of context. Um, and then I mentioned earlier about sattva, it's like the feminine side of the, of the process, it's you know, purity and clarity, essentially. Um, so they're, they're kind of a polarity. And then between them, there's rajas, which is somewhat akin to fire. It's essentially the process of transformation. So you're, you're transforming between one or the other. So uh, the spiritual process is a lot about transforming Thomas into sattva hmm. um, in that transformation process. Uh, so one of the ways that shows up is in healing, uh, in the integration of openings and, and uh, a variety of uh, kinds of things in the process. But of course, it also goes the other way too. You can take purity and, and turn it into inertia. <laughs> and we need some value of, of all of them. <laughs> and if we, if we didn't have any Thomas, there would be no form. and, and uh, we know no mechanism and no way of experiencing uh, things and, and uh, uh, going through this process um, for consciousness to know itself. Because when, when you just have pure consciousness by itself, there's no content, uh, there's nothing to experience uh, except itself. There's not much you can learn uh, about yourself in that. I mean, there's certainly powerful things you can learn about your essential nature, but beyond that. Um, another little detail that's that's worth mentioning from what you were talking about there is, is the distinction between the masculine and feminine processes in there um, with that initial awakening and the unity shift and the brahman shift there are shifts in relationship of, of uh, consciousness with itself and they start with an initial recognition or realization um, realizing that self-realizing itself through the person for example in, in self-realization and then there's an integration and, and unfolding process and and a greater and greater maturity and it kind of gradually moves out into the more and more expressed levels of, of the of this form um, until it's uh, it's kind of a, a maturing process for each uh, stage whereas the uh, feminine process is more a um, a gradual refinement and with a climactic realization like at the at the peak of of uh, refined unity there can be a if there's a, an unfolding uh feminine process um that's very active at the peak of of refined unity there can be a, what's known as god realization where we've initially recognized the hand of the divine or however you want to frame that the, the intelligence that's taking place in the world and and uh in the apparent chaos uh, of of the uh uh, events turn out to have a, a, a guiding hand, so to speak, and there's all this intelligence and the laws of nature that are, are uh, involved in, in everything around us. Um, and then that can unfold into an awareness of those laws of nature in a more personalized way where we can actually experience them as subtle beings. Um, and every culture around the world has various names for those kinds of things like devas and angels and whatnot. Um, and um, and then um, further still, there's this recognition of the divine itself. And that's another one of those things with, that's unique to each person is how we relate to the divine because the divine is so vast and, and like it's everything uh, all at once, um, all time, all, all space, all and more. Um, and so uh, to relate to that, uh, we usually relate to it in a point way, just the way we relate to another person or something like that. And so we tend to have what in the Vedas they call an Ishta Devata or, or a, a preferred form of, of the divine uh, that we relate best to. And, and there's gazillions of examples of that the world over um, as well. And um, and so there's a a process there where where we, we uh, come to recognize um, realization i use the word realization in the sense of recognizing we are so there's a realization that we are god not that we're all of it simultaneously but that we're kind of like a, a point value or a, or a wave of of expression of, of the divine and we're not separate from that so there's a what's known as god realization 
And that can happen before the Brahman shift or happen later on, depending. Uh, I've seen a number of people have, have uh, the refinement process take place later on in the process, but, um, but it's, it's changing, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of incredible evolution taking place. I mean, some of what we're talking about, like pure divinity, uh, didn't even come up. <laughs> it's like even even the references in the old texts were were uh, not uh, well recognized for a long, long time. It's a really recent yeah. development. That's a good point um, for me to kind of just come in on. In reference to subjectivity, we were just discussing it a little bit earlier. How there's a tendency for there to be a projection or an assumption or sort of an interpretation um, from the uh, subjective perspective. Now, when I speak about subjectivity, I'm speaking about supreme subjectivity, and that is this field of conscious awareness itself. That's what uh, enables you or uh, shines forth as your sense of being the subject to all that appears to unfold. So this one supreme subject uh, being of the nature of pure intelligence itself, whatever it holds itself to be, whatever it takes itself to be, um, it tends to see itself in those terms. It, it tends to see that um, in the world or as the world, yeah? And uh, on some level, this also relates to the, the gunas, but in the context of pure divinity, you say that uh, you accurately point out that it's not something that has been uh, a common <laughs> a degree of unfoldment <laughs> until fairly recently. Now, there are many that may feel that that's inaccurate and say, well, this, this so-and-so was in pure divinity and this one was and my, you know, my teacher was in pure divinity and all of this. Um, and so they're taking different contextual modalities or different stages of enlightenment and interpret, interpreting them as, as pure divinity. And that happens quite a bit. Uh, one thing that's also important to recognize is that oftentimes the process stop, stops at a certain stage. It stops at a certain modality um, for the whole lifetime. And it doesn't continue to unfold any further. Uh, and that stage or that, uh, that recognition is complete in itself. It has a sense of completeness. And... Yeah. Um, it is a certain qualitative recognition of infinity within itself. And uh, it perhaps has a certain degree of appropriateness in, uh, in a context, uh, a karmic context, you know, the, the coalescing of experiencing um, into a presentation or a representation, which is uh, most in alignment with the whole. So there's all kinds of different factors that go into the way in which uh, this field unfolds within itself. And uh, there's an intelligence, as you said, there's a hand at work in that. Mm -hmm. Then there's also the potential for sort of uh, self-limitation uh, through a, a lack of understanding or um, a, a lack of motivation or whatever the case may be um, that also can potentially arise. Yeah, it's interesting. There are some traditions who recognize stages, but they won't talk about them because it'll create concepts that uh, that can be a barrier to living them. Because we we get this idea that oh, this is how awakening is supposed to happen. It's it's supposed to look like this, and then it unfolds differently. With you know, as we mentioned, it's common for it to be all kinds of variations in the in that process, mm -hmm. even though it's the same underlying process. And and so. Yeah, I mean, when I first shifted, I had all these concepts of what it was supposed to be like, and of course, didn't meet any of those concepts because the mind can't really conceive of something that hasn't uh, arisen yet. So, but at the same time, do you deny a person a map for the road that they're on? Yes. You know, you don't want to go, you know, if you're in Paris, it's not really that useful to look too closely at a, a map of uh, New York, but um but if you're flying to New York, then it's very valuable, very, very valuable. Because um, I've seen that whole areas of experience that weren't recognized as being there unfolding once they were, were aware they were there. Even I think it's in the seventh model of the, the Rig Veda, the core of the Vedic text, the Siege dimensions, the importance of desiring the unity shift after awakening. Mm. Uh, but you're not going to desire unity if you don't know it's there. Yes. So it's, 
and it's not a desire in the same way of a, a, a seeker would would be craving after en enlightenment um, but um, but just the intention that you know not to stop um, yeah. so it's this kind of it's so it's kind of this dance i mean talking about stages creates concepts and uh, even in, you know um, even though you try not to and but not talking about stages also creates concepts because that's the yeah. nature of the mind yeah. so it's useful to have better concepts i guess you can say <laughs> and, and and but hold them lightly you know not to yeah. take them too seriously but, and just to recognize that you know your own process will be your own process yeah very uh very important and i've found that one of the major uh flows of intelligence that can be supportive surrounding the tendency to over conceptualize or um move into trying to define or um conclude is is uh devotion and uh the willingness to uh, to surrender the willingness to uh give way into this greater intelligence uh, without uh knowing all the details without having it all figured out you know yeah. and even when we directly cognize certain details and that's a clear experiential reality we come to a threshold point where we're called to surrender that as well, you know, yes. to offer that back as well. And this is just a flow of uh, perpetual surrender that yes. is unfolding. And we all have this, uh, I feel that we all have within us this profound uh, willingness, this profound willingness that is moving to be born, you know, moving to be born through us. And that willingness is you know, stretching into itself, leaning into itself, discovering the profound power of itself, you know, uh, and we, we can't have it all figured out. We can't have all, all of our, you know, things checked off and everything in a row the way we want it, because the, the process is not something that is, uh, we're limited. not doing it. We're not doing it. Yes. You know, it's, it's essentially, it's the need of the time. And it's all in the context of the whole. Yeah. It's not about you. It's not personal. So it's not going to happen when it's convenient for you or when, when you want it necessarily. I mean, having a desire is the intention is, is helpful, but um, not to be too, uh, you know, craving about it. No, it's just another attachment. But, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's not about, uh, it's all about the whole and, and what's unfolding to the whole and when it's the right time for, this person to wake up uh, to support that whole and then this person has a it's, it's essentially essentially we have these moments of grace that arise and they're kind of like opportunities and if we're willing to allow those to surrender to, to those moments of grace then those shifts can happen mm. but if we resist that then that opportunity passes and perhaps it goes to someone else um, some other point of uh, uh, value because it's time for that next step of opening and it's all being really uh, beautifully orchestrated so that uh, lots of purification can take place, but not so much that you know, we all go a little bonkers or, or the world starts falling apart or something. Yeah. Um, we need to be able to, to unfold in a, in a process um, where we're integrating as, it, as we go and, and, uh, and uh, you know, moving through this in a systematic way. You know, just like you don't go into... To, uh, start school in grade one and get calculus you're going to have to work you know work through arithmetic and, and mathematics and so on like that and yeah. and, uh, and develop that process and so it it, it uh, develops based on the need and i saw that you know uh, even with, when writing the book i came to the to the uh, uh, last chapter and all i had was quotes like because that stage hadn't unfolded here yet and and then i was shown that uh, there's kind of this pattern uh, the awakening uh, god consciousness unity has a very similar pattern with brahman uh, uh, refined brahman and parabrahman there are certain qualities so like unity has stages parabrahman has stages and uh, i had never seen those described but it just kind of came out and i sort of knew what they were even though they hadn't unfolded here yet mm -hmm. and it was essentially the new of the time the book was coming out that information was was needed and um before that it fully unfolded and then that process began and in that in that uh 
in that uh, point. And so it's kind of like this guided thing, showing what's need needed to be unfolded and, you know, what's this stuff shows up that, that, and I write these articles for my blog, for example, they kind of show up and I'm, I don't know why I'm writing about this or, or whatever. It seems kind of irrelevant or it's not that important or whatever. And then it's exactly what somebody needed to hear and, and so on. Yeah. You know, just the, it, everything happens in the right time and, and through that guiding hand of divinity. Yeah. Yeah. Very, uh, very nice points. It, it's interesting because when this, uh, when things were unfolding here, I was, you know, kind of looking out at the spiritual marketplace or on YouTube. I wasn't a, a, a spiritual seeker per se in, in the way that most are, you know, looking for uh, enlightenment. Um, by the time that I heard non-duality, it was already, you know, uh, shining forth as a reality. So, but I saw that there was a sort of just a, um, what appeared to be at least a lack of depth and, and, uh, and detail, you know, and at least where I was looking, I of course wasn't looking at everywhere, but <laughs> in what was seemed to be generally available. And, yeah. uh, and it also became clear that there is something, you know, that divinity is moving to, um, you know, present itself to, to make itself known uh, to, to shine forth in a way that perhaps has uh has been concealed largely, you know, even in the context of um, spiritual awakening and, um, you know, uh, degrees of realization um, in our, in our history, or at least in what's commonly, you know, spoken about and, and, uh, and presented. And of course there's ex exceptions to that rule. I know you came from a, a background where stages were openly expressed and I had the opportunity um, to be exposed to that understanding. And uh, it also came as a knowingness, you know, in the midst of the unfoldment. But yeah. there, there can be this tendency to, to look at awakening as a solution to a problem. And mm. I think that that's one of the most pervasive ideas in the marketplace, you know, that uh, which then makes the, the, the sense of being a person a problem. And, uh, you know, the initial <laughs> shift, a solution. And that tends to sort of glorify the initial shift and present it as being some kind of end all be all of, of any kind of difficulties, because when there's no separation, yeah. there's no difficult, you know, no difficulty. It's like this, this goal, you know, it's like yeah. buying a house and getting married and getting a light and light. I mean, I had my own, my own goals list when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah. but really, it's it's a platform for living life. It's not a, a, a goal or a, a you know piece of content in itself. It's just it's it's a way of living life yes. from a more um, a much bigger place, basically. Yes. And, and it's for the glorification of divinity. You know, that's yeah. that's one of the major themes that uh, comes through here, and I just feel is so fundamental is that it's not about you know someone being realized, someone being there's no one at a particular stage that stage is at itself it is itself yes. yeah it's, it's so. the self it's the self waking up to yes. itself but we're waking up from the person it's not the person that wakes up yes and, and so they're, they're i refer to them as post-personal stages because it, it's kind of because yeah, there's yeah. these stages of personal development and then we go beyond that into post-personal development yes exactly um, so we're living from a, a what i refer to as a contextual modality that modality of existence which is defined in being the infinite context for all that appears on the level of of content and we're seeing yeah. from there and uh just kind of going back to what you were talking about surrounding um different degrees of integration i find it helpful to to look at each stage or modality as unfolding in a five-phase developmental process which need not be you know figured out or or uh, mm -hmm. categorized or anything, but it's retrospectively supportive. And sometimes in the immediacy, immediacy, it can be helpful. And that starts with the recognition of uh, the recognition of reality in a more essential or fundamental vantage point from the, from the one that previously seemed to be dominant. Mm -hmm. Then there's a transcendence of that previously dominant recognition of reality. And then there's a stabilization of infinity in that new perspective, in that new condition, in that new modality. Then that 
begins the process of unification. Now, this is not the unification that is referential to the, the unification of the masculine and feminine aspects, although that is something to be addressed and definitely a part of, of, the, of the unfoldment. But this could take place at any, any uh, stage or any modality, even if it's just purely masculine. And that unification is essentially a movement for there to be a unification of the discrepancies between the previous recognition of reality and the new or fresh recognition of reality. And so as that is unified, there's also an integration. And that means that that condition is more clearly reflected in the functioning of the body and the mind. So the yeah. nervous system is more clearly reflecting the condition. It's more clearly reflecting that new vantage point, that new perspective of the whole within itself. You know, it's recognized itself at this particular qualitative status or at this particular qualitative modality. And now that is integrated into the functioning of the body and the mind or the flow of experiencing. Yeah. And there's different, you know, ways in which that shows up as well. Yeah, it's kind of like there's a, all those layers between consciousness and the surface, like I yeah. mentioned, and, and each of them is progressively more dense as you go up uh, wherever or out or whatever. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, and each of them th thus takes a little longer to, to be uh, infused and then integrated and, and so on. And so, yeah, mine usually kind of like, you know, like when I first shifted, I had no idea what had happened. It was completely clear that, that my perspective had changed completely but I had no idea what it was because it didn't match any concepts and, and, um, and that, and then it just kind of integrated a little bit and then the mind kind of caught up a few days later. Um, and it just the sense of the sense of what it was, was became obvious as, as well. Yeah. Uh, as it integrated. Very nice. Yes. And, and that's another thing too, that you and I both, uh, are often speaking about is how this is, a, there's no sort of final, final point. There's no ending point that we're, that we're moving towards, you know, um, I would consider this condition here to be in the unification and integration uh, phases of pure divinity, but that is not something that has a completion point, you know, it's perpetual. Yeah. Um, well, there is this potential. This there, there is this potential endpoint, but it's it's so theoretical. <laughs> I mean, it's essentially you, you you would be you know if you read for example the Yoga Sutra, you you have um, you know descriptions of, of being able to you know you make your body any size, mastery over the elements, being able to fly and turn invisible and all this other stuff. I mean, uh, essentially your your physiology would be uh, would be completely uh, under your control. I guess you could say it's it, yes. A master of your entire reality and i don't know that it's even supported in the current uh in the current sure. uh, consciousness there and, also and, may have been it would take hundreds of years to get to that kind of place mm -hmm. so but we can there's a massive amount of room you know prior to that where we can make huge qualitative uh improvements in in our quality of life and the quality of life of those around us and and uh and so forth yes that's another one of the things Go ahead. Yeah, one of, one, of, one of the things that, that happens as, as we become more and more universal in this process is that the purification process becomes more and more universal as well. And so we're purifying not a person anymore, we're purifying the whole collective. And so the more and more people that are deeply integrated and awake, the more and more they're, they're, um, they're healing the collective as well, and, uh, yeah. not just their old baggage, yeah. the whole thing. Very beautiful, yes. So the unification and the integration supports the whole because it is the whole that is realizing itself and realizing mm -hmm. its, its pure divinity. So there's a, there's a natural and spontaneous uh, flow of intelligence which begins to resolve unresolved material um, at deeper and deeper levels. Of course, that does include the seemingly individuated uh, accumulation but then that also begins to branch out into uh, more collective levels of accumulation or, or condensation. And it's important to note here that that's a spontaneous, organic, natural affair. It's yeah. not something that we're uh, doing per se, you know. Um, it just becomes uh, the nature of the way in which the conscious experiencing is flowing. When there is a, a greater degree of openness, there's a tendency for that which is not finding release or resolution 
uh, in areas of closeness to move towards that degree of openness. And so in a certain sense, there's a, a collective release valve or conversion unit uh, that begins to develop. And that requires and also correlates with uh, a certain degree of embodied reflection or integration. So whenever we talk about resolution or transmutation or healing, we're always talking about embodiment. We're always talking about integration. Um, and in cases where there seems to be a lack of embodiment or a lack of integration, that's because it hasn't moved down into those deeper levels of unresolved material, which then naturally begins to reflect as the refinement of the neurophysiology. And what we're seeing is that this nervous system isn't as limited and local as we once thought that it was. Yeah, uh, we're recognizing different values of the body itself, the body as infinity, and that changes according to the contextual modality or the stage of enlightenment. So at, you know, at a certain point, we no longer, it's no longer a local body that is being refined, yeah. but it's a non-local infinite body that is in that process of unification, integration, and embodiment. Yeah, the cosmic body is the is the way I, I talk about it on the blog. Yeah, yeah, the body has cosmic, and it's an interesting thing because you you uh, you come to experience the you're functioning on multiple levels simultaneously. Hmm. You know, you have the body washing dishes, and then there's the cosmic body kind of doing stuff, and the, and the, <laughs> the yeah, it's just all kind of different layers of things happening simultaneously. Beautiful. Yeah, that's another uh, point that we've also gone over before and you kind of touched on there and, and when you were talking about refined unity and what I would refer to as uh, dynamic subjectivity, where there is that um, collapsing of the distinction of the masculine and feminine into one singular self and the, the flow of experiencing and the, the lively, blissful intelligence uh, comes online in a new way. In that, uh, in that period or in that phase, there is the possibility of recognizing this cosmic value of the body or the body as um, infinity. In, the body in, of all bodies. Is the body of all it. bodies, yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that also has different um, possibilities. For instance, there's what I call avataric bodies, um, the Krishnic mm -hmm. body, the Buddhic body, the Christ body. And these are they're almost like watermarks within the self that have been left by avataric degrees of realization. Yes. And um, so we encounter those and we can merge with those and realize those as our self. And the self is seeing that it always was Krishna. It always was Christ. It always was Buddha, you know, and different uh, sages and saints and so on and so forth. But it's never anything personal. So if there's unresolved identification residue, you know, there's potential for there to be misinterpretation or self-limitation surrounding such cognitions or, or degrees of realization. Yeah. But when that flow of healing and transmutation and resolution is, um, is unfolding, then we recognize these as the only one that could ever recognize it. And that is the <laughs> same one that... <laughs> you know, was itself the devotee and that to which the devotion was flowing, you know, simultaneously. Yes. yes. It's just a shift in the perspective. And then uh, it becomes progressively more inclusive. Now yeah. that's only, you know, one particular, like we, we've um, said, that's only referential to a particular modality. And there's different degrees of realization, the realization of the body, even in pure divinity. Um, which uh, we could go over the stages of pure divinity if you want. I, I don't know if you want to go into that, but uh, how that kind um, of shows up or unfolds, at least the, the, the beginning of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to, how to if I, I mean, going into the details is kind of not entirely meaningful um, <laughs> unless there's some context, but it, it's essentially, it's like, um, the whole the physiology becomes immersed i mean the physiology again we're talking about here is cosmic but um the physiology becomes immersed in divinity and uh divinity isn't in this context isn't a, a thing or uh, an object of experience and that kind of stuff in the same way it's 
it's kind of hard to put it into any kind of language. I mean, it's beyond Brahman and Brahman as, you know, how, how do you talk about Brahman? Right. Uh, you know, sometimes people use the uh, neti neti thing, you know, yeah. not this, not this. Um, but essentially it, you become immersed in, in uh, divinity and um, it's kind of like being filled up with white light in a certain kind of way, but it's a much more advanced white light than the, um, a prior one that can unfold. And um, so it's kind of like the values uh, rise up to higher and higher values. Um, yes. So you get the, the um, yeah, I'd have to look it up actually, <laughs> the, 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 the words for the qualities, but, but it kind of moves up through. And one, one of the things that, that happened here too was that at, when it reached a certain level, it essentially I was immersing the devas that were universal uh, laws of nature that were running the cosmic body. Yes. Um, and it's like their way of, of spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like there was a immersing them in divinity triggered their awakening um, and in their style. And it was kind of like, almost like it was a local thing that then falls back into the universal. Yes. And it triggered a huge wave of purification. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> not in a negative way but it just uh uh it wasn't you know rough purification or anything like that it, it was just uh, in, uh, stirring up dust like uh, so to speak sure. and uh and and yeah that's still going on um, yes that's still going uh, so on here, here yeah, every, yeah, <laughs> yeah every so often the, the dust kind of clears for a moment i realize oh there's been some progress and it's now you know it's showing up here now and so on and so the, the stages are gradually unfolding but uh but oof, it's uh, it's yeah, quite distinct from anything I've, I've uh, you know, yes. prior in the process. Yes, um, it can be uh, it can be quite intense. I would say comparatively to the to the modalities um, pre pure divinity, there it was uh, sort of very smooth and uh, <laughs> kind of a, a little bit uh, less intense in the context of that um, surfacing or, or purification. So yeah. it's also important to note here that just like in the initial shift, you know, that is oftentimes deified as being an ending or, um, or some sort of a finality or, or a goal, which, you know, has arisen through different uh, strategic uh, presentations, perhaps uh, expedient means, you know, from different teachers throughout the ages and the, the density of the age and time period and so on and so forth. But um, so th there's a realization that there's more there and then there's unfoldment through different modalities or stages, but then Again, with pure divinity, there's a similar sort of new beginning, if you will, um, yes. where, <laughs> where then we're entering into that um, deepening. <laughs> divinity is entering into a, a deepening of the unfoldment of its reality within itself. And I would say that this is where I move from uh, qualifying it as unification into divinization. And so what we begin to witness mm. is the divinization of the nonlinear body, the divinization of creation, the divinization of the gunas, even the div divinization of the elements, you know. All of this is unfolding as divinity, and it is not uh, an achievement for for some for someone, and it's for the glorification yeah. of divinity within itself. So divinity is glorifying itself. Yeah, because if the laws of nature are waking up, they're not you know personal; they're, they're <laughs> everybody's. You know, so it's it's a whole other layer of of awakening that's taking place in the collective yes yeah uh, it's it's quite a remarkable uh process and, and i'm really enjoying watching the unfolding we have been through this period though in the last uh, couple of years where where there's been a lot of uh purification in the collective and it's kind of like you're in that it's not like it's out there somewhere it's essentially the, the environment you're in mm -hmm. and so of course there's the old thing about the sages are working to awake awaken the world uh because it's that's them too you know it's not yes. like it's a separate thing and so um the, the the more the world awakens the greater the awakening is for everybody in it yes and uh, we can actually experience awakening. we can actually experientially recognize these uh, these sages these values of uh intelligence as sort of literally encircling us and and being in a support network or support system you know where divinity is flowing into these deeper degrees of resolution and purification. And uh, as you said before, it's not like, oh, you can turn a blind eye and say that's going on out there. It's actually happening inside of your body 
as yeah. as infinity. So um, there's no possibility of um, <laughs> ignoring or bypassing <laughs> <laughs> or getting a break. <laughs> break, that's right. Breaks are not um, optional. <laughs> so uh, you know, you know, everyone sort of. It's easy to say this is what you want um, from from a from a certain perspective, and of course, in the heart, it is. Uh, but it's something that comes with a tremendous. Uh, impersonal responsibility and yeah. uh accountability yeah yeah hmm. so it's really uh amazing how we can see that everything uh in terms of a full comprehensive unfoldment comes back down to healing and resolution you know and the willingness to be with uh, what is arising in a way which supports its unification, which supports its conversion, uh, which supports its uh, being folded back into this, this one singular reality uh, in a way which shows up as a greater coherence, as a greater cohesiveness. Yeah, because it's what's unhealed, is uh, unresolved, is, is kind of a shadow. Yeah. Basically, it's, it hides some quality of, of um, wholeness. Yeah. And so uh, as the healing takes place, those shadows are resolved and it all resolves back to light. Yes. Basically. Beautiful. And then it's seen. And then it can be known and 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 know that that aspect of, of the unfolding for the whole can know that 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 perspective, that pers uh, of the whole. And it adds that to the whole. But it has to that healing has to take place for that to be seen. Mm. So this means that we're not in a competition <laughs> no. when each when each perspective and each uh, each degree of unfoldment is is sort of adding to that cumulative coalescing of the flowering of life within itself, and yeah. that when we see each other unfolding the process, we're seeing ourselves. So we can rejoice in that seeing. We can rejoice in the profound degree of um, grace that is revealing itself through all of these shifts unfolding and these higher stages unfolding, higher modalities unfolding. It is such a great gift, such a great opportunity to be here in this particular time uh, together. Yes. So I don't know if I have anything else. Uh, do you have anything else that you feel that we've missed or? Uh, nothing comes to mind. Uh, did we want to have uh, some yeah, questions and such? Yes, yeah, so let's uh, let's open it up for questions. And uh, if everyone, we're going to remain on the screen um, spotlighted, so we're not going to have the the video uh, show up for those that are asking the questions. But we will be able to hear you. Uh, David and I will both be able to hear you. So if you want to ask a, a specific question uh, addressed to a specific one of us or I know David, you know, David isn't always available like this live uh, uh, in the in the flesh, so to speak, to ask him questions. So it's a rare opportunity. And uh, so if you just want to unmute yourself or sort of raise your hand and uh, L will perhaps give you a signal or you could just un unmute yourself um, one at a time and ask that question and uh, and we'll we'll continue to uh, record. Hello. Hey there. Hi. Uh, I'd enjoy asking a question if I could. Yes, please. Um, uh, it's for David. Hi, David. Hi. Um, Chris. I'm uh, familiar with your posts, um, The Raptures, and also 100 Times the Bliss. And um, and speaking about purification and stuff, um, I know I felt that uh, kind of fleur de lis pattern you speak of with the heart. Mm -hmm. But I had a different experience, and I, I thought I'd seen it on your blog, but I couldn't find it where there was um, 
something to do with the heart kind of like blowing out in the back. Do you, do you know anything about that? Um, yeah. Um, there's various, uh, what, what happens with, with uh, most of us is we, uh, because of the nature of our, of the collective experience, our experience of being in the world, is we develop, the, develop a crust around the heart. And so part of that process of awakening the heart is um, breaking that crust. And um, so there, and, and allows, and then the heart can get essentially bigger than the body. Um, and um, well, it can actually become infinite. And, and then there's kind of this movement of um, forward and backwards. It's kind of like the um, different, on different levels, the chakras are experienced different ways. Like there can be experienced as kind of like a geometry or like a flower or, or like a, a vortex or, or a kind of a, 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 a vortex funnel uh, on the different levels. Um, but in the, you know, from a floral perspective, it's kind of like there's this flower uh, that's, uh, that's there and it has roots going back. And so depending on how that unfolds, it may unfold in awareness or it may unfold um, uh, as a kind of a, like it may unfold gently or it may unfold suddenly <laughs> and uh, as, as more of a breaking open or, or uh, something like that. And there's a huge number of variations of how that might unfold. Um, I mean, I've written a few articles in the heart and it kind of became this thing where, well, there's this way and there's this, and there's like, a, there's the Anahata chakra and there's the Hridaya, the high heart, or it's sometimes called, or the, the, it's kind of like a higher resolution value of the heart. And there's the kind of a, a secondary chakra up here and there's one over here and <laughs> there's all these kind of layers. It's this whole infrastructure <laughs> around the heart area, like the fleur de lis pattern that, that, that um, it was, which you know, I did some research on that turned out to go way back uh, before the French and there's kind of this, this energy flow that and it would wear the fleur de lis on the chest because it, it uh, kind of represented that the masculine and feminine and, and, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, so there's a number of ways that might unfold, but certainly uh, breaking open can certainly be an experience in a number of different ways. Okay, thank you very much. It's, sure. it's not easy to find people to talk to you about that. Thank you. Okay, maybe I can ask something. So, uh, I'd like to ask about this transition where, you know, when the heart becomes kind of more universally loving and uh, this gets reflected in the relationships, in the kind of ordinary relationships, which uh, mm. like even where, you know, the egoically dominated, uh, yeah. you know, or proximity. Uh, yeah, even, even with, um, before the heart opening, uh, when we shed our uh, tendency to, uh, like a lot of the time we have kind of these habits that in, in our relationships where we see them a certain way. And um, so we have this ha these habits of relating and habits of automatic response without, you know, uh, we're, but we're reacting to what our expectations of, of the person we're with. And so in that process of, of even just the awakening itself, um, those kind of things fall away. And, um, you know, if we're being conscious about it and, and healing also, and, um, and then we see through those stories we might have about somebody and, and we're just able to be with them as they are there. And then there's a whole other level that can come to that when the, the heart awakens. Um, and, um, um, and then we're able to express levels of love and compassion that are uh, far greater than you know, individual. Now, it's interesting to, to note on this too, is that we have this we talked a little bit about integration and we have this capacity that's far beyond what we might expect. Uh, Chris mentioned, for example, the thousand times the bliss or the raptures and stuff. There's this really interesting process that can, ha can happen where, where we open to another level of bliss or another, uh, and there's huge waves of, of intense happiness or in the case of the heart, intense love. 
and then in a relatively short period of time, it becomes the new normal and it becomes our new platform. And then we're in a place where um, a whole other level can open from there. And it's kind of a, um, and one of those interesting things of a, I mean, they, one of the terms they use for uh, an established self-realization initial awakening is Satchitananda or in the Buddhist context, Nirvana. And uh, Satchitananda essentially means um, absolute bliss consciousness where bliss is, is definitely a part of, uh, of the, the, the common experience. And that, that can be uh, very uh, in your face sometimes uh, even to the point of being a rapturous um, where we just, it just overwhelms. Um, not in a negative way, of course, but I just, you know, very, very <laughs> happy. <laughs> and, and, um, and, uh, and then it becomes, that becomes the new normal. And it's like before, we, I mean, there can be these places where we have this big wave of happiness and then it passes uh, as an experience. But in terms of bliss itself, um, the celestial level, uh, kind of two up from consciousness, in the kosha seven level kosha model um, uh, is essentially a field of bliss and as that through refinement and healing as that opens to our awareness essentially that is just there all the time um, to some value i mean certainly it can get overshadowed a little bit by uh, stronger purification or or uh, whatever um, that's going on in our life it can be you know it's not necessarily in our face all the time but it's kind of you know if we stop for a moment the consciousness is there the bliss is there and it's like the attention on it and um and it just becomes an ongoing uh background um so it's a um so it's kind of that difference between um uh, a taste where we we have the experience and it falls back and this is true of just about any aspect of this and when it becomes ongoing to some 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 value of ongoing where it's that that value uh, there's been sufficient healing um, and the experience, and so that value has opened in the awareness and uh, becomes ongoing. Not, not it's not like um, you know, experiencing this glass. Um, it's there, and, and I put my attention over there, and it's not in my attention. Um, it's kind of in the same way. The bliss is kind of there, but it, uh, it can be in the background or it could be in the foreground or whatever like that. It's not like we're we're dysfunctional. Although you know, if we go through a wave of of rapture or something, then <laughs> we can be a little dysfunctional for, for a bit of time. Uh, there's a couple of people I, I recall have joked about you hoping that those kind of things don't happen in public. <laughs> uh, one of the early uh, Buddha the Gas Bump interviews that Rick did, uh, one of the fellows, uh, Tom Trainer, shared a story of he was in the front row of a large uh, public event and when he had a... Uh, a rapturous experience and <laughs> made a bit of noise. And <laughs> so it's not, not the ideal place for that. <laughs> but those things come when they come. Again, not, not according to our convenience. I can say a couple things about that too, Tomek. Uh, so you've, I'm sure you've heard me speak recently about the, um, the play of concealment and, and revealment or what I might also call the, the presence absence principle, where there does seem to be this um, concealment of presence within an apparent absence uh, through you know, self-definitions and the conscious experiencing. And then there seems to be a progressive revealment of, of presence and there's you know, degrees of presence and absence and what could be seen as like a mixture um, in a certain sense. And, uh, so what we taste as love or, or as bliss or as compassion uh, is constantly evolving or, or being revealed um, in higher orders, we might say, or higher values. And uh, in that context, there's also, you know, the, the unfoldment that pertains to the unification and the integration of that um, and its reflection in, in the nervous system. So the physiology becomes more uh, acclimatized to that, uh, which is what David was just talking about and, and yeah. more clearly reflects it as a sort of a non-durational um, continuousness. So it's not within the context of beginnings or endings. It's something that's timelessly um, realized and recognized and 
uh, shining as an aspect of, of what you are. And in that, we also have, you know, how that shows up in the conscious experiencing and the flow of experiencing itself. And when it comes to love, I found that, uh, you know, depending on the, the uh, how would we say, the, the, the inclination or the, the, uh, uh, the phase or the stage or the, the, the background, we can begin to taste, you know, certain flows of devotional love just in the midst of daily experiencing with, um, with any human being. I mean, just checking out at the, at the cash register at the store, um, you know, driving, seeing someone at the red light, um, just a quick glance. And we'll come to see that that hand of divinity is actually sort of working underneath all of that, that there's this, this very sweet, benevolent flow of love that is finding its way and sort of tasting itself. And we'll also find that there are many that are scared of that, that um, back away from it. Um, because in egoic dominance, that's not something that we're familiar with. We're not familiar with that kind of love. Uh, and it can be uncomfortable or feel kind of weird or, you know, what's going on there. And there's a tendency to personalize uh, love, you know, to make it into an exchange or a transaction that's taking place between me and you, you know, um, and here and there. And so that's one thing to um, watch out for on some level um, is just to have an awareness of the tendency for there to be a personalization of that impersonal flow of love. And, um, and to recognize that, you know, there's different degrees of comfort with that. But also, you know, I'm not suggesting in any way whatsoever that there's any kind of control mechanism set up or, you know, resistance to it. But it's just sort of a, an intelligent awareness of how its operation uh, or its sort of revelation more appropriately can be as cohesive as possible. In, in a certain sense, what's also taking place is that the, as that residue is clearing or being converted through transmutation, um, the, the, the film that was covering the conscious experiencing is being cleared. And so we, we are seeing that love um, shining through, shining through the eyes of others, shining through um, the conscious experiencing of ourself, and in you know, uh, and in certain cases, in your case, there's no others. You know, it's not an other for particularly, um, but that continues to unfold. That revelation continues to deepen, and as a part of that, we're also, uh, you know surrendering or there is a surrendering of the previous recognition of what love is the the previous recognition of what compassion is you know so there's maybe a way in which it's showing up for a while and that is how it is and then there there's a threshold point i've found that is reached and there's a call for that to be surrendered um, and this is where we may touch into any kind of subtle attachments that have developed to bliss or to love or to mm -hmm. anything like that and so um, those, are, those, are, those points are very supportive and they're just continuous, you know, because, um, and as that is surrendered, then a new degree of intensity is shining forth, a, a deeper uh, recognition. And uh, the love can become so intense that it has to sort of spontaneously um, mediates itself. It, uh, because uh, otherwise it, it uh, you know, to make simple eye contact with someone can be, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> so yeah, I found, you know, there was a certain stage where I didn't, I, the body was always looking down, you know, <laughs> in the grocery store, you don't want to look at anyone because you end up <laughs> just uh, flowering in that. And uh, like I said, it's not always welcomed. <laughs> so um, there's, you know, there's just, a flow of intelligence that's finding its way in that context. And I found that it, having a worshipful attitude um, where it's seen that that love is the, the, the reflection of divinity within itself, you know, um, even in the midst of what appear to be, you know, uh, relationships that are defined in just mundane roles or whatever the case may be, to allow that to be recognized as a lelic flow of love yeah and we can begin to see that as divine play as love tasting itself seeing itself 
knowing itself um, in a very, very sweet way. And there, this has actually been spoken about um, in, in many ways, but in particular in certain devotional traditions within the understanding of what they call bhavas or rasas. And there are these different flavors of love um, that seem to be referential to different roles, like brotherly love, motherly love, um, loving as a lover. You know, there's all these different flavors and that can show up in a very impersonal way uh, in its highest, in its higher degrees of revealment. And it can be seen as a way in which divinity is self-interacting within its own light, within conscious awareness, the effulgence that is shining forth from itself. And um, yeah, it's a very profound gift and opportunity, you know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how it, how it unfolds. You may find that devotion is kind of this really foreign kind of idea. Um, like a lot of people develop a bit of a resistance to the uh, such ideas uh, from their <laughs> early experience with with church or something like that, and obligations or whatever. And, you know, see, you know, devotion is kind of like this blind faith thing or something like that. But when you reach a place where, um, like when I, when I, the, in the, in the God consciousness process with the awakening heart, that higher value of the heart, um, for me, it was like having this giant fire hose blasting out, uh, out of my chest. And it's like, it, it needed, it needed some direction <laughs> to flow to, because it was just kind of blasting all over the place. And, um, and so, so that's where, where then in that stage, I mean, later on, it, 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 it evolves, but in that stage, there can be the, the need for an object of devotion, a place to put that. Um, so yeah, the, you know, you're not randomly, uh, randomly uh, pouring on people at the, the, where it's not so welcome because um, it can trigger purification in other people when you, <laughs> you blast them like that. So it's, uh, it's not, not necessarily uh, comfortable. So um so yeah, there's there's that point, and then it depends there on on um, what you're comfortable with with doing. Like in the traditions, they talk, for example, about devotion to God. So where you have your you know Ishta Devata, I mentioned before, your your form of God that you're most you most relate to as an object of devotion, or or your um, uh, sometimes your teacher. Uh, but that has to be in an appropriate kind of way, not not as a it's not a hero worship kind of thing. This is this is like a uh, just a, a, a flowing of self to itself, um, and and uh, and then there's sometimes the the one's uh, partner uh, mate uh, is it can be a suitable object of devotion if they're comfortable with that kind of intensity. Um, yeah, and it but it depends on on you know all the, the dynamics. Um, where 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 that directs so it's even even and this is even with people who you know some people have a more uh uh analytical approach to this process and some people are more um what's the word um karma yogis they they, they work stuff out through doing uh that's kind of their dominant everybody has a bit of it, all of it but um uh, but even even in you know, so sort of people who aren't as devotionally oriented there can be very devotional periods that arise because of those kinds of openings um, where there's still, we still have to meet those, um, those needs. And it's a, yeah, it's kind of an amazing process. Yeah. Yeah. David and I are planning on having a talk on devotion specifically uh, in a couple of weeks, I think. So. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Um, Peter. I wanted to ask about um, as um, as the realization becomes more and more universal, it seems like there's still always going to be that which is unresolved within it, um, that which is structured in the denial of light or whatever. And I was just wondering if you could speak about how that is held, especially from pure divinity. And also maybe like, how does that remain? How is it? And is it just like always like perpetually there that there's, you know, maybe lower astral material 
but it's not always in full in awareness or I don't know if you could just speak on that. Sure, I can start, David, if you want. Sure. There's a, what comes to mind as you uh, ask about that, Pete, is the, the oft quoted and, and famous Bodhisattva vow, uh, which is, goes something like this, sentient beings are numberless, I vow to save them all. So in that vow, there's a recognition that although there are numberless sentient beings, I vow to save them all. Now that would seem to not make sense, you know, intellectually. Uh, how can you save all of the numberless beings when there isn't a particular number? And what we come to see is that the principle that's being expressed there is the principle of perpetual surrender or perpetual service. Yeah. So that is itself. The vow is the, is the power of itself. It's not a literal um, activity, you know. It's that degree of commitment, that degree of willingness, and that degree of surrender, yeah, which doesn't see, you know, some point of, of uh, stopping and doesn't see a need for there to be a point of stopping. Because as you said, there'll always be another planet. There'll always be another, you know, <laughs> always be... There have always been, apparently, these things. From the perspective of pure divinity, we see that they're not actually there in the way they seem to be. Yeah. So it's always within the realm of appearance. Yeah. Yet it still continues to seem to flow. It still continues to spontaneously, uh, naturally, yeah, pour itself into itself for the sake of pouring itself into itself. And what I've found is that it isn't about there being this, this kind of place where we can say, all right, there, that's finished. You know, we reached the goal of getting all the darkness out of here or wh whatever the case may be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the sweetness of it is in just the, the churning and the turning of that wheel, which knows no limits. It knows no time. It knows no end. It isn't concerned with that. And it is just perpetually revealing, you know, its love and its power and its grace and its glory for the sake of revealing its love and its power and its grace and its glory. Now, you know, David, I'm sure we'll fill you in on the, on the yugic perspective and kind of the understanding of cycles of time and how there are different degrees of light and, and revealment in that and, and, from a Vedic perspective, how, you know, there's creations and dissolutions that are sort of, sort of continuously unfolding. And so in that respect, there is a, there is a point where the seeming darkness of this universe will be no more <laughs> because the seemingness of this universe will be no more. But uh, we also have the potential to, to cognize beyond just this universe and this multiverse and, you know, uh, those kinds of things. It's not an often talked about subject, but it is very possible and very much unfolding and will continue to unfold um, on this planetary system, particularly now, particularly now since we're entering into um, a, a, a much more refined time, an age of grace. So I don't know if uh, you have anything to say around that, David. Yeah, just a little bit more. Uh, one of the things uh, that's key in this is the relative balance there needs to be some value of shadow for there to be this appearance of form and for experiences to unfold and stuff like that. But in the cycles of time, I don't know if I want to get into the whole yuga thing at this point, but, but um, just kind of like there's essentially there's seasons um, in, in consciousness, just as there's seasons and, you know, annual seasons and so on. Um, and so these, these cycles of rising and, and falling consciousness and the, the golden age uh, and silver ages are like three quarters of the time. Um, but we're now in a time we're just rising out of a darker age. And, um, and so the relative balance of, of shadow is, is greater at the moment. And, 
and that that's you know led to our current experience so what we're trying to do is, is shift some of that shadow out and clear it out and, and raise the experience so that the the sattva becomes dominant instead of the top the tamas uh, guna the clarity the the purity uh the flow of love and bliss and so on uh become a much more prominent than than they have been in the last few thousand years beautiful yeah, so this is uh, pete this is kind of what i was referring to with the presence absence principle and the play of concealment and revealment and yeah. from, a, from a transmutative perspective what this means is that there's more food on the table <laughs> and uh so we're and we're hungry yeah we're hungry so it also means that there's more lead to be revealed as gold and there's a sweetness in that revelation uh that is for its own sake you know it isn't based in the typical human understanding of like fixing things because it's not in pure divinity you don't see anything that needs fixing um, pure divinity doesn't see anything needing fixing at the same time it isn't some sort of you know uh, there you recognize that in order for there to be evolution there doesn't have to be an underlying sense of imperfection that evolution can flower from perfection in perfection for its own sake so i don't have to feel like something is wrong or out of place in order for there to be a movement to go beyond it in order for there to be a natural um, inclination for its resolution. That's one of the major limitations is we have learned that that is a motivation. You know, we need to feel that something is wrong or imperfect in order to make it better, in order to fix it. And we'll come to find, and we are coming to find, that that motivation is severely disempowered and lacking in potency and oftentimes actually ends up feeding back into a loop which just goes around and round and round and round without any real degree of, of resolution taking place i mean it's there but it's you know slight and uh, accompanied by lots of recondensation and things so um we, our motivation can be one of love it can be one of for its own sakeness and willingness and commitment and devotion and uh, just the natural inclination towards evolution. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Very beautiful. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. So um, I'm just wondering, uh, as these cycles of time continue, um, it seems like, I guess, Rama and Krishna and the stories came back to kind of, or, you know, they came to kind of prepare the ground so that when that dark age comes that, you know, mankind can kind of pass through it with a certain level of support and you can kind of see that in, uh, you know, the work that's been done by the great sages and such to kind of like, you know, allow for, uh, yeah, like mankind to pass through that dark age with, yeah, that kind of foundation still in place in some regard. So my question is, um, I don't know if there's been much talk about how, like, is it always kind of back to zero as that cycle of time or as, as the as the planet and the collective consciousness slowly kind of unifies like on different levels right now we may be seeing it as like you know kind of different representations like for instance the zoom call um you know it's like there's a sense of there you know a, a un unification of the planet happening on you know right now on like a more gross level but um as that consciousness grows is there the possibility that like the next dark age wouldn't be like kind of the same thing you know it's it's kind of it would be it would maybe be darker but it wouldn't be quite the same thing that happened in in the past here on this planet so that's my question um yeah there's a few ways of of looking at it um each, each cycle is a little different uh, because of the, 
the trends of and the way the sub cycles are running and and just the kinds of experiences that have unfolded and so on but um one of the things to recognize also though is is the the appearance of cycles is part of the appearance it's part of the way things to, seem to be flowing uh, in the um, the way the, the the learning process is taking place. But from a higher pers perspective, um, that cycle is uh, is just an appearance that has already all happened, and uh, it, it's kind of like from a divine perspective, it was kind of like a brief moment. Of, kind of up a uh, brief thought and but and the divine is so comprehensive that it includes um you know many universes and and uh <laughs> gazillions of beings and and uh and so forth um in this apparent cycle and so on like that and so um you might think of it like um you know we're, we're a point of experience and for us to experience you know, divinity is just too vast for a, for a, a point to experience, and so we have we kind of experience this this value this this uh, immediate quality of of divinities that are that are more localized, and um, in that then we we get into the experience of having space and time and and a, an apparent sequence of unfolding and and cycles of of rising and falling and and this kind of thing as a mechanism for for the point to unfold it, but from a larger perspective, um, uh, that's not actually. It's just a. It's, it's a mechanism for the for the experience to take place in. It's not sort of the highest reality um, of it, but it's sort of meaningless to talk about in of itself because that's not how we experience the world. Because we are experiencing it through the vast majority of people, anyways, are experiencing it through a point value. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not. I mean, the, 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 the quality of it is that the dark age is the shortest period and that, that we're, um, the golden age is by far the longest, so more than four times the dark. Um, and um, the other part of it, of what's going on is kind of a bit out of cycle. Um, Krishna talked about it just before he dropped the body. Um, and some other sages have talked about it as well. We're kind of in this, we're in a rising cycle towards a golden age, but there's a, a number of thousands of years before um, that golden age is expected to be here. We're kind of in this model, uh, we're kind of in what's called the Dwapara or the, the uh, energy age. And you see like the, the discovery of electricity and, and uh, the energy healing and, and this kind of, you know, various kinds of things around um, energy awareness. Uh, developing and a lot of technology and, and uh, uh, those are that's one of the major qualities of, of the period um, and um, but because of this uh, other aspects of the cycle that's going on uh, we have this um, opportunity to go directly towards a, a golden age in a much faster um, way than usual so essentially we'll have a golden age right through the next scheduled golden age and you know um, um, so for a, a longer period and um, when I was when I first learned to meditate uh, one of the teachers I, I spoke to at the time talked about the, the, the opportunity was there but he didn't know whether we were going to make it or not or whether we get lost in, our, in the shadow or whether we, we break through and, and uh, have that shift and, and it became apparent to and several spiritual teachers at the time talked about it, that it became apparent that we managed to hit the transition point mm -hmm. and, uh, and make that shift. And so there's been this gradual unfolding um, of, of that. And, you know, of course, when I first uh, started to meditate, the, this idea of, of awakening was, was a wonderful thing. And, and uh, you know, uh, there was some talk that it would take about five, five, 10 years kind of a thing. Um, but I'm not sure if the, the 20-somethings of those days would, would have been happy to hear that it would take 40. But, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, now it's actually flowering. And there's all these people who have been meditating for decades who, who are uh, awakening now. 
and that's clearing the ground also for other people to awaken much more quickly and easily. Um, and, um, and so this transition is, is, uh, is accelerating. And uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was one of the teachers I mentioned, and he, he, uh, um, he saw there was this kind of wave of awakening that started in around 2006. Um, there certainly was, it was gradually accelerating, but it picked up quite a bit more dramatically then. And, um, um, and that's, he, he dropped the body in 2008, basically saying that his work was done. He'd spread the seeds around the world and gotten all these millions of people meditating and, and made meditation a more household word and, and so on. And so many people took up, you know, various forms of, of practice and, and so on. And, and, uh, and that's uh, really started to bear fruit then. So we're kind of now in this, uh, moved into this uh, more intense transitional period. Uh, and uh, I couldn't tell you how long this is going to take um, uh, because it, it kind of, there's sort of free will is still in play there on a, on a, on a certain level where, where people can choose how they respond to, to, like there's a lot of stuff being uh, coming to the surface in the collective. And people can choose to get involved in the dramas and, and you know, make a big fuss um, and suffer, or they can choose to heal and see it as an opportunity for, for uh, healing. And there's some of both going on. Um, and um, the, but, so it's really valuable to recognize that that's what's going on so that there is an opportunity for healing. Because otherwise, we just there can be that tendency to fall into the drama, and it can look like the world's kind of falling apart in certain ways. Um, but um, it's really a part of this much grander healing going on to prepare the ground so that so that uh, this can be uh, lived by um, far more people, and and, it, and it's it, it's going to change the world in all kinds of ways because consciousness gets to a certain point. Um, it's kind of the, the, there's kind of phase transition points where we get to another level. It's kind of like you know the awakening goes through stages, so we reach a certain point, and then there's a shift, and then we you know gradually embody that. The same kind of process is going to take place on the collective, and um, people in general uh, will live as if at a certain point when there's enough people awake, clearly awake and established, everybody's going to experience life as if they're awake, even if they're not. I mean, that, that kind of, you know, even if it's not established in their physiology, just because it's kind of, it's, the collective is essentially awake. Um, and so that, that process, I have no idea how long it's gonna take, um, but, uh, you know, some that are much uh, wiser than myself uh, are suggesting it's gonna be within our lifetimes, but yeah. we'll see. It'll be really interesting to watch this uh, unfolding. So we're kind of in the bumpier phase in some ways in the, uh, at the moment, but, uh, but it's like a phase transition thing. You, know, you come out the other side and it's kind of like it clicks over at a certain point and, and, uh, and then it becomes much more obvious to everybody. Like right now, it's not at all obvious to most people, but at a certain point it will be. Beautiful, David. Yogesh, I can say a couple of things on that too. Just on that last point you made, David, we, co we can come to recognize turbulence as oftentimes being a precursor to a collapse into a, a, a deeper recognition of reality or, um, you know, a sign that things are moving, so to speak. Um, things are stirring and that that stirring has the potential to flower and, you know, in a certain way, it's evolutionary, it's nature. I tend to, uh, f you know, feel that um, all four of the yugic periods are going on simultaneously on multiple levels, you know, simultaneously in the sense that David was talking about just generally from the already doneness, but then also simultaneously in our, on our current, you know, sort of collective um, condition in our current collective condition. So we have those that are in a golden age. We have those that are in energy, energy age. We have those that are in a silver age. We have those that are in a iron age all simultaneously together. And mm. there, there's a dominant age, you know, in, in the midst of that. So, um, and that dominant age uh, is what we, you know, is kind of what is classically referred to as the age. But within the context of that, there's simultaneous yugic um, unfoldment, you know, perspectives, um, according to, to different groups, different levels of conscious experiencing. 
Yeah, that's more on the level of the feminine side there, uh, the, the purification and, and uh, healing. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the one thing that's important to note is that everything is recorded automatically within the self, within the field of conscious awareness. Nothing is forgotten. Everything is recorded. And so this can shed a little bit more light on the, on the perspective of the, of yugas and unfoldment. And, and what David was talking about is that divinity, that the actualization of the potentiality of the light of divinity is touching in to every possible actualization of itself, it's touching into every possible configuration of itself. It's experiencing itself as the unfoldment of various dimensional configurations and, and, um, situations, circumstances, you know, from uh, innumerable vantage points simultaneously. Yeah. And all of that is recorded. So on the level of that actualization, it's perpetually in process because it's infinite. At the same time, it's complete. So I often speak about how it's simultaneously complete, yet apparently in process. The in process aspect is apparent, you know, from the perspective of the completion, it's not going on or it's already gone on and is just there, you know? So, but from the perspective of the point value and from the perspective of the process, it does seem to be going on, but in that seeming, we can be established in the completion while it still seems to be unfolding. Yeah. That completion is established in itself. We aren't as individuals, uh, separate individuals, but as the one that is established within its own realization of completion. So you've perhaps heard me speak about the tension threshold collapse function, which is the way that I describe the, the flow of conscious experiencing through the primary distinction of pure awareness and conscious presence. And every time that, that the, the tension is a potentiality which is collapsing into actuality, collapsing into configurations of itself. And that is recorded. Every collapse is recorded. And that tension threshold collapse function is flowing at a rate that is imperceivable um, by many. Yeah. And that is an infinite recording network, an infinite recording system. And the Vedas have spoken about this. They've spoken about a concept that David would be able to tell you more about called Smriti, um, yeah. which is like cosmic memory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and so this kind of b begins to shed some awareness on the, the intelligence that's at work here um, that is appearing to unfold as these different cycles. And, you know, I mean, goodness gracious, if you look into the Vedic understanding of the cyclical emergence of potential, it's like amazing. They, <laughs> this one's within this one's within this one's, you know, within the, and it just unfolds like that. And all of that is recorded. It's all recorded, recorded, recorded. And so a dark age is going to be different than the previous dark age. Nothing is predetermined. There's likelihood and probability and higher degrees and lesser degrees of that. But everything is self-experiencing, self-evolving, self-creating. And the conscious experiencing seems to be finding its own way in the context of a particular phase of unfoldment of that potential. And that is a fresh recording of these unique conglomerations of, you know, perspective and conditions and all of those different things. Yeah. So that kind of is something that I would take into consideration in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I have to do a whole talk on that one. <laughs> Thank you, guys. That was that was really great, David. So good to see you on here, brother. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. So, so here's a little question and that is, can we do this again? Yes. David, do you think we can do this again? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. A, it's such a, a great format, both, you know, just in terms of our being present, as you were saying at the very beginning, Andrew, and then, and sorry, somebody just started a leaf blower out here. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, also uh, just uh, because we have the two backgrounds, uh, the two of you with, you know, we do different approaches. Uh, I'm, I'm a TMer like David is. So it's really wonderful to see, particularly your approach, Andrew, with respect to um, 
masculine, feminine, and and uh, your observation of development and, and awakenings through the, 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 the let's call it the feminine shakti path, and something that we we sort of didn't grow up with on you know in our approach. So it's it's really great to see these different perspectives. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it'd be wonderful for us to do this again, David. Uh, maybe in uh, August would be a good uh, time for us to set something up. Uh, David mm -hmm. and I are also uh, already going to be recording something at the 1st of July. So we'll plan to uh, do another one of these in August. Yeah. And we have another group conversation coming up too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. David and uh, Dorothy and I are also going to be recording another conversation on uh, individuality. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that suggestion. <laughs> yeah, profound, profound uh, silence. It's alive, flowing. It's alive. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> That's all right. Watch out. <laughs> they get you. Get hit with one of those rapturous. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, my friend, uh, for taking the time to, to to speak with me and to speak with all of us. Uh, I have some uh, comments here. You guys are just so wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this. It's a beautiful frequency to experience. Material on pure divinity is hard to come by. <laughs> so it's literally a godsend uh, to hear you both. That is true. <laughs> yeah, most of the pure divinity stuff is devotional, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's more poetic. Uh... Mm -hmm. but uh less and less will it be hard to come by and mm -hmm. as it's coming through here and uh it's making its way into formation into expression in a in a more clearly delineated uh format so uh, yeah yeah it's worth noting in, in that regard too that there's lots of people who are awake that um their dharma or their their way of embodying it is not about uh, teaching or writing or, or any kind of way they, they just live it and and yeah. bring their contribution to the whole in their own way yeah and so That's it takes sufficient theory. yeah it takes sufficient numbers of people to have those the ones that are kind of you know talking about it more directly and uh, kind of thing um, it's not just the people talking about it that are living it there's vastly more people who are awake than are out there mm -hmm. uh, visible mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a supply and demand situation. Um, <laughs> so the <laughs> call and response. When the when the call comes forward, the response <laughs> is drawn out. You know, it's not yes. merely for uh, you know pleasure, <laughs> although it's not unpleasurable. <laughs> okay, thank you all so much. Thank you. All right, thank you, David. Bye.